when I was a child, I remember the, the first time my parents traveled with me deep into Mexico. Uh, this was like in the 1970s and uh, uh, we would drive into some very small villages where there, there was not a single car. And I remember being so scared because if we stopped to eat some, somewhere, uh, there were so many kids who would come and surround the car. Uh, I, I didn't know what they were doing. They were just, uh, you know, they were loud and all over and my dad could barely move it. And it was like a mob. <laughs> and then my dad would get out of the car and they would just be all around him and they'd follow him inside and they would barely let him take any steps forward. Uh, everything turned out to be fine and everywhere, every, everywhere we went. But I, I did not become a, a fan of big crowds. Um, crowds can get out of hand very easily. And this is something that was starting to happen to Jesus. Um, his popularity was growing so much that crowds were starting to, to follow him, to press in on him. And as we've been going verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark, uh, we've come to the third chapter. And we've seen that Jesus has already performed many miracles and the news of what Jesus is doing is starting to spread. As I said, these crowds are starting to gather. Some people were coming literally from hundreds of miles away. And in Mark chapter three, Jesus goes out to these outlying areas and he's going further out into the countryside where there were many villages. Some scholars estimate that there was about 200 towns in that whole area that we're going to that we're going to look at today, where that's going to be described, uh, and and each town averaged about 15,000 people. So, 200 town villages, towns and villages, 15,000 people each on average. Okay, so word is starting to spread very quickly, and so we pick it up here in Mark chapter three, starting verse seven through ten. Look at this. It says um, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and from around uh, Tyre and Sidon, where the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because, because of the crowd, lest they get this, lest they crush him. So Jesus is afraid that they will just like uh, smash him and for he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. So Jesus uh, could have performed a miracle. I mean, he could have just disappeared uh, if he wanted to. He could have walked on water. He could have uh, sent a storm to scatter everybody out. But instead he made preparations so that he would he and his disciples would not get crushed because the people seemed so determined to touch him hoping for a miracle uh, they were not really here to hear uh, they were not really here to uh, for Jesus teaching uh, they were here for healing and I have to admit that I would probably be just like that crowd pressing in uh, on Jesus to see what he could do. Uh, my mom, uh, who raised me, um, she, she, uh, when she was younger, she was in a terrible uh, car accident before, she was my stepmom, and but before she came into our lives, uh, when she was younger, she had, was coming back from a funeral, I think it was, it was in California or something, and when they were driving through, um, in the middle of the night, they were in New Mexico, and the car started started flipping over and over again. And she had so many broken bones and was in the hospital there in New Mexico for months and months. And she ended up with, with so much metal in her arm that she, she was not able to straighten it out completely for the rest of her life. And her leg had, had uh, pins in them, uh, metal pins to keep, keep things together. And she had these huge stitches on her arms and her legs from the multiple operations that they did. So if, if Jesus were doing this kind of healing, you can guarantee I, I would have taken her. Uh, I, I would have done my best to, to see to it that she touched him or he touched her. It would, it would have been beautiful to see her healthy and fully restored. Uh, but uh, even today, you know, people still come to God for 
for some of the same reasons. You know, folks are not always so interested <clears throat> in what Jesus is teaching, but, but they want the blessings that he can offer. Some of us, you know, we may have come for, to God because we had a problem that humbled us and we fell on our knees and it made us get serious about our relationship with God. <clears throat> Maybe we were sick or a loved one was sick and we said, God, if you'll bring healing, I promise uh, this or that, right? Or uh, God, if you get me this job or this promotion or this raise, I promise to give uh, the right way. Uh, uh, Lord, let my, my son or daughter find uh, the right spouse, you know, those things. And these, these are the desires of the heart that people have. And we look to God uh, for help. I remember uh, we have Jack White here. Uh, he is the overseer here at the place where we record the message in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, years ago when I met Jack, he, had, he was just on the tail end of his cancer treatment. And uh, by the grace of God, he was fully healed. Uh, and he had already been serving the Lord. Uh, and when God healed him of his cancer, uh, it just put even more resolve in him to serve the Lord even more. And to this very day, he's been faithful to the Lord for as long as I've known him. Uh, he runs the care center here, you know, where they give food and clothing to the needy. Um, he and his wife, uh, Linda, they, they even have just today, he was telling me uh, right before the service that uh, they, for years they have been sending prayer cards to people. And this morning they went to a, a faci a, like a retirement home, nursing facility kind of thing and where they have like a little Sunday morning service early and uh, the lady wanted to share testimony and she invited them to come because she wanted them to see that she had kept all the cards through all the years and she like put them out, she had them all there. 600 cards, can you imagine, of every week praying for them. It was 600 or 700, how many were? Yeah, I just laid them all out of like, oh, like, where she just felt like someone was praying for me and she just wanted to say, I'm so grateful for that. Um, I, I wish uh, that everyone, uh, that more people would stay committed like that, especially after God helps them or, or answers their prayers, that they don't forget what he did. But the reality is that they don't always stick as much as we might hope they would. Um, some people get their big problem solved and, and after a little while they just, they just go on about their business. Uh, God, has, God has blessed us more than we realize, all of us. Uh, we might give thanks for it and sometimes we might not. But God is good to everyone every day. Uh, Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 45, for he, for God, gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. So for people listening that day when Jesus said that, who grew up in an agricultural society, they grew their own food, this was a huge statement that Jesus was making. He's saying that God blesses those who love him and he also blesses those who hate him. Uh, notice that evil people enjoy the sun and the rain just like good people do. The unjust can enjoy good food and friendship and family just like the just do. Uh, and if God shows that kind of kindness to those who don't trust him, imagine how much more he cares for those who do. Jesus said, that our Heavenly Father knows even the, the number of hairs on our head. God knows all of the big stuff going on in our lives, and He knows all of the tiniest details about us. So when we trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, we begin a relationship with God. He's our Father. We are His children. God's grace is with us as some blessings uh, we can actually count, but there are so many others that we just, I mean, we, it would never end. So many things that God does. 
he, he's the one who, who opens doors. He's the one who surrounds us by his angels. And the more we, we get to know him, the more we see that his ways are best. We see that, that there's wisdom in his word. Um, Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Notice that righteousness isn't something passive. No, it's something that is sought after with intensity, like a hunger, like a thirst. Like when you're really, really thirsty, you can't think about anything else but water. Uh, it's hard to even uh, uh, study or read something or enjoy music. It, it is all consuming if your body is thirsty. There, there's a story about a Marine corporal named Joey uh, Mora, uh, Mora. Uh, years ago, he, he was standing on the platform uh, of, of an aircraft carrier that was patrolling the sea near Iran. He was gone for 36 hours and before they realized on board that he was missing. A search and rescue started, but it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. After 24 hours of looking for him, they called off the rescue. Uh, no one believed that there was any way that anyone could survive out at sea that long. His parents were notified that Corporal Mora was missing and presumed dead. What they didn't know was that four Pakistani fishermen had found Mr. Mora 72 hours after he fell off the aircraft carrier. He had made a flotation device from his pants. And th this is something the US Navy, the Navy SEALs, they, they teach their sailors to do. When the fishermen found Corporal Mora, he was dehydrated from being in the salt water for so long. He was delirious, his throat was dry, his tongue and his lips were cracked. When the fishermen found him, all he wanted was water. He was so thirsty. Had he not been found, he would have died without fresh water. God created mankind with thirsty souls. We all long for meaning and purpose deep down. We all want to know who we are and why we're here. Deep down, we all desire to be loved. We want to know, we want to know and be known. And this is something that we should all be grateful for when it comes to our relationship with God. Psalm 139, 1 says, O oh Lord, you have, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. Did you get that? The psalmist is saying, Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. Listen to that. It's saying that God knows us completely and he still loves us fully. He knows us completely and he still loves us fully. That is what can satisfy our thirsty souls. God knows everything about us, he still accepts us. And he invites us into a relationship with him. And that's why you often feel refreshed, you know, after we've come together in times like this and we, we uh, worship God and we hear from his word, we're drinking fresh water. We're being satisfied. And that's why where Jesus said, you know, you, you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be satisfied we can have a peace that surpasses our understanding. The turmoil in our hearts can be replaced with tranquility. The pangs can be replaced by rest. Joy can spring up from the inside out. Uh, one of the times that we went to uh, the uh, men's retreat up in the hill country, the Texas hill country at the HEB center, uh, we found one of those places where the fresh water springs up from the ground like it was bubbling from the, to the surface right there is like one of the sources and up from that spot as you come up the bank there were already they were building this really nice uh facility this new facility and i couldn't believe how how they were able to get all of that material there uh through the winding roads up and down across the river to that spot by the bank um 
and they brought all of the you know the the machines they brought they brought all the materials they brought dirt to more dirt to level it all out but imagine if they had brought a load of dirt in and the driver got his uh, gps coordinates wrong they didn't but imagine <laughs> if they they had backed up the truck full of dirt on top of that spring imagine if the next driver followed that one and dumped dirt in the same spot. Then another truck came and another truck came. Listen, they could put a mound of dirt on top of that spring and it would look like that spring water was gone. It would look initially like the water had been compromised. It would look like the dirt won this round. But just give it some time. You may not see it, you may not feel it. There would not be some eruption like a volcano, but deep down inside all that dirt, the water is still coming up. And pretty soon, we'll start to wash all of that dirt downstream. Water beats dirt every time. That's a picture of what happens inside of our souls. Jesus said in John 4.14, 4, those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. Why? Notice he says, it becomes like a, like a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. So there are times when life will dump dirt on us. Problems will mount. Trouble will build. Stress will create pressure. The boss will dump on us. Someone in our family might dump on us. Coworkers and customers might unload their dirt on us. Everyone just seems at times to be piling on. We might start to feel overwhelmed. We might uh, feel mad or sad. We might start to get anxious and worried. We, we're afraid that this, this is how things are gonna be from now on, but listen. There is a spring inside of our souls that is bubbling with living water and nothing can stop it. Nothing in this world can stop the flow. Uh, our, our sin, our, even our own sin might dump a load over it. Our bad mistakes may cover it. Our own pride might dump dirt on it. But if you are a child of God, you are being sanctified, you are being washed. And if you are thirsty today, it's not because God didn't provide the water he promised, it's because we didn't drink. He invites us to come and drink deeply. God tells us in, in Psalm 81.10, he says, uh, open your mouth wide and I will fill it with good things. Open your mouth why? And I will fill it with good things, he says. Some people think that if they really give everything over to God, that he will mislead them. Uh, they don't know if they can really trust him. And God is saying here, listen, have faith in me. Trust me. Open your mouth wide and you'll taste good things. Your soul will be satisfied. And in verse 16, later on there in Psalm 81, the Lord says, I will feed you with the finest wheat. I would satisfy you with wild honey from the rock. Uh, now, Psalm 81 there is very interesting because it's a quote from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. This came from a song that God told Moses to write down so that the people would remember the song. You see, when God's people entered into the promised land, all of their dreams were about to come true. They would live in houses they didn't build. They would drink from wells they didn't dig. They would eat from trees that they did not plant. They were no longer slaves. They were walking in freedom now. And they would conquer giants. They would win battles. And all God is telling Moses to do, it's interesting, is to compose a song of all things so that they would remember all that God had done for them because God knew that right there it was easy for them 
to forget all that God had done for them. It would be easy for the people to grow comfortable and complacent. They would be so blessed, so prosperous. God didn't want them to forget where the goodness came from. He didn't want them to forget where they, that when they placed their trust in him, he took care of them. In the dry desert, he provided for them. He protected them. He strengthened them. He forgave them and loved them. And that's why God could have stopped right there by saying, like, uh, open your mouth and I will feed you with the finest wheat. But, but uh, no, the, he says, oh, there's honey in the rock. And that means that he goes on to give them something sweet and delicious. He didn't, he didn't have to do that. They could have just survived on the wheat. But God is a good God, he's telling them. He, he's describing himself. He, that, that he's a loving father. Uh, God, God was reminding them that he was the source then, and he's the source now. He's the rock. And the grace that flows from our God is sweet. The blessings that come from our God are sweet. When we follow God, people think that it's all about you know, a bunch of rules and do's and don'ts. But it's, it's not just about that. We believe that God's ways are best. We believe that God wants our lives to be full and abundant. You see, God rewards obedience. And there's wisdom in following after God. And as we follow God's will and God's ways, that means that we become the best versions of ourselves. Uh, some days may not seem like it. <laughs> Sometimes you may not feel like it. But God strengthens us in our weakness. He gives us understanding so that we can make decisions with fewer regrets. He is our fortress. He is our strong tower. And that's why the psalmist, uh, that's what the psalmist had in mind in Psalm 61 where he wrote, I cry to you for help when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the towering rock of safety for you are my safe refuge a fortress where my enemies cannot reach me let me live forever in your sanctuary safe beneath the shelter of your wings uh, God wants us to run to him when life is bad and when life is good he wants us to run to him when there's a storm and when the skies are clear but keep seeking him with all that is within you. Oh, open wide your mouth and he will fill it with good things. He, you know, we do our part and God will do his part. God loves it when we remember that he is the source of our supply. Don't forget that we are where we are and we know who we know by God's grace. And just as he opened doors, God can close those doors. And let's not forget how far he's brought us, preserved us, helped us. Let's not lose our posture of, of humility. And the way we keep that posture is by having a heart filled with gratitude. No matter how much God blesses, give, give God thanks, the thanks that he deserves. And the more grace you have, the more thanks you should give. Our God is never ending. He's our source and our supply. His supply never runs dry. Uh, this is very important to remember because we might get a paycheck from our employer. But that employer is a stream, not the source. The stream may dry up, but our source never will. He has an ocean of blessings. So don't worry about it. the source running dry. His love for you is so great that he sacrificed his only son on a cruel cross to rescue us. And that's why what the uh, Apostle Paul articulated so well in Romans 8, 37 through 39, he says, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life 
neither angels nor rulers, neither present things nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. Nothing else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's one of the reasons, you know, I love when we have, when, uh, you know, our, our wor live worship songs that we have, we see people praising God so much, you know, uh, sometimes they're crying because they're so thankful for what God has done in their lives. Worship reminds us of God's goodness. Uh, worship ex exalts him to his proper place. And so I'll sing even if I lose my voice because you don't know what he brought me through. E even on the way here, we were about s running about seven minutes late today. And we came across a terrible accident. There were lights flashing and uh, the police were just arriving. And out in the field was a car and then another car and then another car and oh gosh. And, and my wife mentioned, she said, you know, if, if another would come on time, we might have been right in that accident. I don't know, but I'm grateful. We can't forget what God has done for us. The smarter we are, the more talented we are, the more influential we get, the more prosperous we are, the more we have to remind ourselves of how good God is. Uh, there's, a, there's an old movie starring Burt Reynolds, uh, also from the 70s, I think. Uh, it's, it's called The End, because he's trying to end his life in the movie. Uh, in the opening scene, he swims out into the ocean as far as he can until he's completely exhausted. And then he, he lets himself go underwater and you can hear like from his vantage point, you can see above and his heart stops. And then after a few moments, he comes up from the, from the water and he realizes that he wants to live and he's, he's breathing for air. Uh, and he sees that this was a horrible mistake. And so he turns around and he looks to the shore and it is so far away. He's already so tired. And he's so desperate that he, he starts to pray. And as he's swimming back, he's, he's praying. And he promises that he'll obey the Ten Commandments. And then he realizes that he doesn't even know all the Ten Commandments. So he promises to learn the Ten Commandments. And then he's still so far from shore. And he, he promises that if God helps him, that he'll give 80% of, of all of his earnings. And, and he keeps getting closer and closer to shore until finally uh, he gets... Uh, so close that now it's down to 10% <laughs> instead of the 80%. And when he finally arrives on dry land, he says, well, Lord, let's just forget about what I said before. I think I can make it from here on my own. And sadly, that's how many people look at God. He's like a giant Santa Claus in the sky. We can ask him for stuff. But if we can just get it ourselves, even better, people will say. Or they get what they want and they walk away. No, we, we can't be like that. We can not forget. And that's why I, I want to finish with, this, uh, with the next couple of verses from our scripture today in Mark chapter 3. Because it finishes this, this vignette in a powerful way. It leaves us with this profound picture that Jesus is not a rabbit's foot that we go to to rub for good luck. No, he's Lord. He's not a toy that you play with until you get bored. No, he's Lord. And so let's look at what happened here in Mark 3. And remember, the people have come from miles around. The crowd's pressing in on him. And they're not at all interested in hearing what Jesus has to preach, to say. And look at what happens. Uh, Mark 3, verses 11 and 12. It says, And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, those are demons. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, 
they fell down before him and they cried out you are the son of God and he strictly ordered them to not make him known again people with diseases were coming to Jesus for healing some of those physical ailments were due to demons inside of them and this was this you'll see this keep to continue to happen in Jesus' earthly ministry, as you read through the Gospels, the demons would often take the possessed person and when they saw Jesus, they would fall to the ground. And in this case, he yelled out, you, they would recognize him for who he was. You are the son of God. Now, Jesus had not yet revealed to the people that he was the son of God. And this might be because it would have added more fuel to the fire that the people would have wanted to crown him king right then and there. And that would have been a huge problem. Uh, the religious leaders would have jumped all over that. Uh, they would have handed him over to the Romans right away as a traitor to be crucified before. You know, that, that was one thing that the Romans did not tolerate. They would not tolerate any revolutionaries or any uprisings. So it wasn't time for all the people to know exactly who Jesus was yet. But the demons knew who he was immediately. And as soon as they saw him, they fell down, they're crying out loud. And, and notice how creatures like this, evil demons, can still, can know that Jesus is the son of God, and yet they still rebel against him. They have an understanding, but there's no submission to him. They're just afraid that he'll send them away. And that goes for human beings as well. People can know that Jesus is Lord and still not follow him. Confessing Christ is a step to salvation. But there has to be a surrender of the heart where we submit our will to his will, where we trust him as our Lord and Savior. James 2.19 says, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. And then he says, even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. So we have to each decide on our own to follow Jesus and to surrender our will to him. We have to welcome him in to reign and rule inside of our hearts. And this is how we enter into relationship with God the Father. This is how we are adopted into the family of God. Uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So if you've not done that now, no matter where you're listening today around the world, confess your sin. Believe that Jesus is the Savior and trust him as your Lord today. Let's go to God together in prayer. Father, we confess that there are times when we take the credit. There are times when we are not as grateful as we ought to be. We don't stop to count our blessings like we should. But Father, we acknowledge here and now that you are Lord of all that you're our source and we believe that you're the one who watches out for us and helps us every single day to wake up and to lie down, to have love and friends and family and, and good things in life. And so we just want to say thank you for being our good father. We bless you. We exalt you. We worship you as you rightfully deserve. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.